So that's what we're going to be talking about today. What is salvation? This year we've been working on our discipleship pathway, preaching on that, starting off talking about how we need Jesus as Lord of our life. We talked about our identity in Jesus. Uh, we, we, we described a disciple as someone who is called by God, who is changed by God, who is on mission with God. And right now we're looking at this theology section. What is this solid footing that we stand on? And today's topic is, what is salvation? Last week we looked at who is man and what is sin. So looking for what is salvation, I started in the dictionary. Easton's Bible Dictionary has this to say about salvation. This word is used of the deliverance of the Israelites from the Egyptians and of deliverance generally from evil or danger. In the New Testament, it is specially used with reference to the great deliverance from the guilt and the pollution of sin wrought out by Jesus Christ, the great salvation. For today's purposes, this that latter portion of this definition that we're looking at, this great salvation that comes to us by the work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But in order to be saved, we must be saved from something. So what is it that we are saved from? So last week, Mike talked about who is man. Man is created in the image of God. We were given by God the right, the command to rule over creation and to subdue it. But then humankind sinned and fell and were no longer to perfectly fulfill this obligation that God gave us. Each one of us, we learn, is a sinful creature who misses the mark of what we are supposed to do. And that missing of the mark is what sin is. Either we're aiming at the right target and we're off center, or sometimes we're even aiming at the wrong target instead of the one that God wants us to aim at. Although we can try, We can try really hard. It is impossible for us to remove the filth of sin from our lives. We are sinful creatures. And if that were the end of the story, we would be in dire straits. A just God would be just in condemning us. Paul tells us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. And that's what we deserve. But praise God that he is also merciful and full of grace. And the conclusion of that that verse in Romans says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So verses 1 through 3 in Ephesians 2 says this, Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us, not some, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Paul tells us that in and of ourselves, we are sinful, that there is no hope for us. The world will tell us something different. The world wants us to believe that mankind is generally good. That if we work hard enough and try hard enough, we can achieve anything that we want. We are not generally good creatures. We are fallen creatures. We are sinful creatures. That is who we are. Nothing we do can fix that or change that. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Friends, if you believe that, and you've never said amen in a service before, this is your time to say amen. Is there an amen? Amen. Hear that again, friends. 
But God, so rich in mercy, he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Notice what it doesn't say here. It doesn't say that because of how often you read the Bible, you were saved from your sins. Or how often you prayed to God, you were saved from your sins. Doesn't matter how much money you put in that offering plate, that you're saved from your sins. You cannot buy it. You cannot get it from your deeds. It is only, only through Christ that we get salvation from our sins. But in John chapter 6, verses 35 through 40, here's what Jesus says. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all, all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up on the last day. So hear this, verse 40. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up on the last day. Becoming a follower of Jesus is not about becoming a better person. That's part of what happens, but that's not the purpose. It's not about being nice to the people around you. It's about regeneration. Our old self, our old sinful self is dead. It is gone. It is no more. And instead, a new creation is brought up in its place. And this creation is in the fullness of God's love and mercy and is saved What did he do? He gave a gift. This is a hard thing for a lot of us. I am a horrible gift receiver. When I receive a gift, I never think that I'm worthy of that gift. Or I always feel that I need to reciprocate somehow to give back to the person who gave the gift to me. That it's a quid pro quo in some way. But that's not what Jesus has here. Verses 8 through 10 says this of Ephesians 2. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I've said it already in this sermon. I'll say it again. There is nothing we can do to warrant salvation. There's no many bi number of Bible verses you have to memorize. There's no number of prayers you can say. No amount you can give to the church that will buy you salvation. It is only by receiving and accepting the free gift that we can have salvation. God loves it when we accept this gift. He loves showing off this new creation that he has created after the old creation is dead and gone. He is overjoyed when we give up running our own lives and instead fully rely on him for all that we have, all that we say, and all that we do. What does all this mean for our lives? Why does it matter? First of all, we need to realize that we are sinners. That we have continuously fallen short of what God expects of us. And that the just reward of our sin is death. God has given that sentence because he is a holy God. This acceptance is the first step of any 12-step program. When you accept that you have the addiction or the problem. In this case, our addiction, our problem is sin. None of us is good enough. None of us is churchy enough or rich enough. We are all born in sin and death. But God, 
But God sent his son to earth in human form of Jesus as, Naz- of, as Jesus of Nazareth. This Jesus was fully God and fully man. He lived a perfect life that we are unable to do. He died an innocent man on the cross. He was buried on the third day he rose again to life. He walked on earth in this resurrected form, showing himself to many, and then he was raised up to the right hand of the Father Almighty, where he judges the earth rightfully. Through this death, burial, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, he bought our freedom from sin. And those who call on him and give him lordship over their lives will be saved. When through faith we believe this truth about Jesus, we are transformed. Our old sinful self is buried and the new self is raised to life. The new self has been purchased by the innocent blood of Jesus Christ. So those are the facts we've been presented to you. Now the ball's in your court. What do you do about it? 